welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start tackling Ezra's eagle. Uh, ever since I started the channel, people have been bringing this up over and over and over again, which is fine. I know that it's a really popular idea right now. I know there's a Facebook group that's called Ezra's Eagle. Um, I'm familiar, believe me, I'm familiar with, with Michael B. Rush. Uh, I knew about Ezra's Eagle before I started the channel. Uh, now I actually have the time and the motivation to look into it deeper. And so uh, this one is going to have to be part of a series, maybe just a few videos. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I realized I, I need to really dig down and get into it. We need to first look at certain things and then maybe look at the actual passage itself. And then after that, just look at different resources and stuff. So this is going to be the first of I don't know how many videos. OK, but first, uh, I have another person that's responded to my call for missionary photos. Uh, if you would like to share your missionary photo um, or photos, uh, send it to my email. My email is in the description of the video. It's my.christian.homestead at gmail.com. Just send it there and I'll include it at the beginning of a, of a, of a video in the future. Okay, so this one is, um, th she says, my name is Ellis Y. Lee. I, marry, I am married and have five children, all grown up. My conversion story is at, and then she has a link. So I'll put that link in the description if you would like to go and uh, see her conversion story. I am located at San Francisco, California. I am now retired and watch grandkids, two of them, ages four and one and a half. My mission is in was in the Hong Kong, China, uh, in from 1975 to 1976. That is really cool. Just as a side note, that's really cool, especially like that early, doing a mission in Hong Kong, China. Now, Hong Kong, uh, if you're familiar with China, uh, Hong Kong was not owned, but it, it's weird. the The United Kingdom leased. Hong Kong for a hundred years, <laughs> at least Hong Kong for a hundred years. Uh, I don't know if it was 99 or a hundred years. I think it was a full hundred years. Anyway, uh, it was around that time. I'm not like a expert on their history, but the lease ran up and uh, I think that was in the nineties when the lease ran out. But anyway, it's really cool. So Hong Kong is different uh, culturally than the rest of China. Uh, it's been more westernized uh, even to this day. All right, so anyway, that time is around uh, th that time it was around 10,000 members and it looks like still the same. Uh, people kept leaving to other country and not too many members stay there. No temple yet uh, back then. Uh, the temple was built in 1977. The year it went back to China. Oh, so we're back to China in 1977. Um, all right, so that is her. This is Ellis Y. Lee. Thank you for sharing your mission photos. It's really cool to see this and to meet you. Again, if anyone else has any other photos, feel free to send it to me and I'll, I'll highlight it at the beginning of a video. Okay, so I felt like first we need to do our due diligence. Um, go back, see who exactly was Ezra, why was he significant? Why would he have had this vision? So on and so forth. So what I usually like to do is just start at the church website, uh, ideally in something like the Bible Dictionary, which is what we have pulled up here. This is the Bible Dictionary entry for Ezra. Okay, so Ezra was a famous priest and scribe who brought back part of the exiles from, from captivity. So this is the from the captivity in Babylon, right? I have my uh, neat uh, timeline here. My uh, these two timeline timelines made by the church. So we all know, um, you know, around the time of the Book of Mormon, Lehi was led away. Jerusalem and Israel fell to Babylon. Uh, the exiles were taken to Babylon, at least the ones that Babylon wanted to have those that those that were rich or that were useful that had skills and then time goes by and then they were 
uh, they returned, right? And that's where Ezra comes in. And you'll notice, you can't see it too well here, but where my cursor is at, this is Ezra. And then right after that is Malachi. Okay, so this is basically at the end of the uh, the Old Testament record. That's what we're looking at. So all this other stuff had already happened. Isaiah, um, Solomon's Temple, King David, Ruth. You know, that was all before, all before Ezra. The only one that was, it seems to be after Ezra is Malachi. Okay, so... So he was a priest, so not a prophet, a priest. So uh, a Cohen, that's what the Jews call them, Cohens. So not a Levite, as in just like an average person from the tribe of Levi, uh, someone who was descended from Aaron. Okay, so a famous priest and scribe who brought back part of the exiles from captivity. The object of his mission was, quote, to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. In 458 BC, he obtained from Artaxerxes an important edict, allowing him to take to Jerusalem any Jewish exiles who cared to go, along with offerings for the temple, uh, which he was entrusted, and giving to the Jews various rights and privileges. Now remember, the first temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed by the Babylonians, so it needed to be reconstructed. Uh, he, he was also directed to appoint magistrates and judges. On arriving in Jerusalem, his first reform was to cause the Jews to separate from their foreign wives, and a list is given of those who had, who had offended in this way. Now, why was that important? It was important because um, being married to, to foreign wives, uh, that would bring about uh, different things, different false beliefs, uh, primarily idolatry, right? And so now that Israel had been punished, the Lord punished them by allowing Babylon to conquer them. Uh, they were carried into exile. The temple was destroyed. Uh, now it's time to repent, get th things up and running, and essentially purify again um, Israel now that some mercy had been given and that time was up. So, okay, the later history of Ezra is found in the book of Nehemiah, which is a sequel to the book of Ezra. Along with Nehemiah, he took steps, in, he took steps to instruct the people in the Mosaic Law. Hitherto, the law had been, to a great extent, the exclusive possession of the priests. So that sounds like a similar thing, like in early Christianity, that you didn't have access to the Bible. Um, you know, you, you, you basically just depended on, uh, well, those priests uh, to teach you the commandments. So, okay, the opening reading of the book of the law was a new departure and marked the law as the center of Jewish national life. And they're, they're all big into that, even to this day. Uh, I'm no expert on it, but I know that during their services, I, I, I don't know when, but at certain times, they have people come up, they pull out the scroll out of the ark. In fact, let me see. Jewish synagogue ark. They have like a, there's like a chest at the back of the room, at the back of the synagogue or wherever, where they keep the scrolls. See right there? So uh, the, 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 the scriptures, I mean, the scriptures in scroll form. And then they'll, you stand up when the ark is unveiled and opened and you take out the scrolls and then, uh, here's a picture of it right here. Let's see, let's do... Jewish boy reading from scroll. And they'll have like the, um, you know, look at that, that you have the little instrument to help, um, help you read along as you're reading through the, the scriptures there. So I'm assuming that this kind of thing came about uh, as, a, as a result of Ezra. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I'm not a scholar. 
but that's kind of what I'm getting out of this. A good many traditions have gathered around the name of Ezra. He is said to have formed the canon of Hebrew scripture and to have established an important national council called the Great Synagogue over which he presided. But none of these traditions, sorry, but for none of these traditions is there trustworthy evidence. Okay, so there's not trustworthy evidence for the great synagogue or um, the canonization of the Hebrew scripture. The Jews of later days were inclined to attribute the influence of Ezra every religious development between the days of Nehemiah and the Maccabees. So if we look at the if we look at the timeline here, uh, I think it shows it here. There's the Maccabees. Okay, so you see Ezra right here. Sorry, I can't zoom in anymore on this one. It's already zoomed in. Look at my my cursor, Ezra, and then the Maccabees are over here. Because you have to remember, I, I always think of it in terms of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You have Babylon, the time that Babylon were the ones that dominated uh, Israel, essentially, were giving them problems. And that's, I have the pictures pulled up. Let's see. See, Babylon. So this this statue really is a timeline. It's a timeline. Starts with Babylon, and then it goes on to the Persians, and then it goes on to the Greeks, uh, otherwise known, uh, this particular empire known as the Macedonian Empire, Alexander the Great, and then after that, the Roman Empire, and then after that, modern day nation states, uh, descended from the Roman Empire. So the Maccabees were at this point right here, the the arms of silver, uh, the Midians and the uh, wrong uh, during this, the belly and thighs of brass, the Macedonian Empire. So the Maccabees right here just before the Romans. So the Maccabees had to do with this Macedonian Empire then after that, the Romans, which is the time of Christ. Okay, so okay, so let's go back here. <laughs> the book of Ezra contains also an introductory section, Ezra chapters 1 through 6, describing events that happened from 60 to 80 years before the arrival of Ezra in Jerusalem. That is, the decree of Cyrus in 537 B.C., and the return of the Jews under Zerubbabel, or Zerubbabel, however you want to pronounce it. The attempt to build the temple in the hindrances due to the Samaritans, the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah, and the completion of the temple in 516 BC. There's no record in the book of any events between this date and the mission of Ezra. Religious values in the book of Ezra. Now, this is not to be confused with um, where Ezra's eagle comes from. Ezra's eagle comes from an apocryphal book that's attributed to Ezra. And it's known uh, primarily as Second Estras, which is, a, which is a variation of the name Ezra. Second Estras. It's not in our Bible. It's an apocryphal book. But I'm just getting us all familiar with who Ezra is. So religious values of the book of Ezra in our Bible are found in the teaching that one, the promises of the Lord through his prophets shall all be fulfilled. Two, discipline and patience are born of disappointment as one expectation after another was frustrated. Three, there is eternal significance in everyday life. And four, uh, preparation is needed for the rule of Messiah, because at that time, uh, Christ was actually relatively close, relatively close when you compare it to the, like the times of Abraham or David or any other time, relatively close. Uh, the law being the schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. The law to bring men to Christ. That's what it. What that was the intent of the law. So now let's go to the Bible dictionary and let's read about the Apocrypha. And I'm sure you've probably read this before. I know that I have. 
Okay, so, uh, and I'm just going to read just a couple portion of portions of this. Okay, apocrypha means secret or hidden. By this word uh, is generally meant those sacred books of the Jewish people that were not included in the Hebrew Bible. See canon. So they're non-canonical books. They are valuable as forming a link connecting the Old and New Testaments and are regarded in the church as useful reading, although not all the books are of equal value. They are the subject of a revelation recorded in DNC 91, in which it is stated that the contents are mostly correct, but with many interpolations by man. Among these books, the following are of special value. Before I do that, let's hop back over to the timeline. And if you didn't know, there is a bit of time in between Malachi and the time of Christ right here. So what they're saying is that uh, some of these books kind of fill in the gap right here between Ezra, Malachi, and then the time of Christ. In fact, there's a first and second book of the Maccabees, and then there's other ones that you can look at. And I don't know, maybe maybe we will we will someday on this channel. But so we're we're looking at this time period uh, right here. Well, actually, it, it, looking. Uh, in studying Ezra's eagle, I guess we're kind of looking right here at the beginning of this period. Okay, so it's saying that the following books are of special value. Uh, the first book of Estrus, or in other words, that again, that's Ezra. The second book of Estrus, the book of Tobit, uh, the book of Judith, the rest of the chapters of the book of Esther, the book of the wisdom of Solomon, uh, the Wisdom of Jesus, the Son of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus. Um, the Book of Baruch. Epistle of Jeremy. The Song of the Three Children. The History of Susanna. Bell and the Dragon. <clears throat> that sounds interesting. Uh, the Prayer of Manassas. The First Book of the Maccabees. The Second Book of the Maccabees. And then there's more on top of that, but this Bible Dictionary article is saying that those are the ones of particular value to Latter-day Saints. Um, so I highlighted the the part that has to do with second Edra, the second book of Esdras because that's what we're going to be looking at. So it contains seven visions or revelations made to Ezra who is represented as grieving over the afflictions of his people and perplexed at the triumph of Gentile sinners. The book is marked by a tone of deep melancholy. The only note of consolation is presented in the thought, the thought of the retribution that is to fall upon the heads of the Gentiles who have crushed the Jews. The references to the Messiah deserve special notice. Many scholars feel the book was composed in the first century. So, see, that's kind of our first problem uh, with this whole thing because I saw that on a few other sites uh, as I was doing the research. Is that 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 does seem to be the consensus is that it was composed in the first century. So, in other words, that it would not have been written by that the book itself wouldn't have been written by Estrus. Uh, this is something I need to study more. Um, just because it was composed in the first century, were they essentially composing it based on real information somewhere? Uh, were, they, were they consolidating different things into a book? Uh, in the, so I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's one thing that I gotta I gotta resolve before I would accept that the Ezra's Eagle thing is a thing because if it's just if it's a if it's a product of the first century then it's not what it claims to be right but I don't know I'm not gonna like just make judgment on that right now but I have to take that into account okay and then I wanted to read the last paragraph the books mentioned above taken together make up what is generally known as the Apocrypha. 
They were frequently printed along with the canonical scriptures. The Roman Church, or in other words, the Catholic Church, regards as part of the canon the books of Tobit, or Tobit, I don't know, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and the additions to Daniel and Esther. Besides these books, there are other Jewish apocryphal writings. The chief are the Psalms of Solomon, the Book of Enoch, uh, the Apocalypse of Baruch, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Now, we, we have actually dived into this. Uh, because I'm doing a playlist, it's not complete yet, but I'm going, I'm looking at each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and um, I'm going tribe by tribe, <clears throat> and the Testament of the 12 Patriarchs claims to be um, the last words of each of the the 12 sons of, of Israel. So we've read the Testament of um, Reuben and Simeon, and when you read it, I get like a really good feeling from it, but it almost seems a little bit too good to be true. Uh, there's, there's people that believe that these are also uh, products of the early first or second century. So I still read them though, because who knows that I, I like how they're written. They don't give you a bad feeling. Uh, like I feel like you can feel the spirit and it, it sounds right like doctrinally, the things that are said, there's nothing that sounds weird or like it would go against the church. So uh, anyway, Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, that's kind of like one of my favorite things right now. Okay, the Assumption of Moses, the Book of Jubilees, and the Sibylline Oracles. Okay, so Second Cedrus, uh, according to the Bible Dictionary, is one of the one of the books that are of special value, uh, although it could have been written in the first century AD. Let's read a little bit more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's read a little bit more. This is out of the Old, the Old Testament student manual uh, for, what is it, for Institute, right? Yeah, for Institute. Where do the books of Ezra and Nehemiah fit into the Old Testament? The books of the Bible do not all fall into chronological order. Their position is determined usually by whether they are historical or prophetic books. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah were originally part of a compilation that included 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are actually the last two historical books of the Old Testament. Okay. Ezra and Nehemiah are the last two historical books. Zechariah and Haggai were prophets during the same period. Malachi is the only prophet known to have served in Israel between the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and the beginning of the, of the New Testament. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of Israel's history from the first return to Jerusalem until the end of Nehemiah's second term as governor of Judah. And when we look at these timelines here, uh, they have they have the returns listed as first return, second return, and third return. And Ezra in this particular graphic seems to be associated with the second return. Uh, the first return you have down here, Haggai, Zechariah, Temple Rebuilt, and then second return, Ezra, and then third return, Malachi ambiguously seems to kind of fit into that. Let's look at this other one here. So here you still have the three returns, and um, it still seems to kind of match up. The first return with Zechariah, the second return with Ezra, the third return with Malachi. So uh, don't quote me on that, but that's just the way it looks on these um, timelines. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Let's see. There was a little bit more from this that I wanted to read. Okay. What was Ezra's background and what was his assignment from the Persian emperor? Josephus, 
uh, Josephus was a historian at the time of Christ. Josephus spoke of the circumstances in Jerusalem at the time of Ezra and how he was assigned to correct the situation. Ezra is known as a Cedrus in the Josephus account. Ezra was a man of great faith and one moved by the Spirit of the Lord. He petitioned King Xerxes for permission to return with more Jews. So, therefore, that's the second return, right? So, that there was already the first return. This is the second one. He's asking Xerxes if he can do a second one. Okay, Ezra the scribe. In addition to being a priest, Ezra was, quote, a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel, end quote. Ezra, the scribe of the law, was charged by the Persian king to teach the people in Jerusalem of the law and then set up a judgment system for the lawbreakers. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that's referring to, you know, Persian law uh, still being subject to the Persian Empire, uh, I believe. Elder James E. Talmadge explained the system of scribes set up by Ezra and the consequences of that system in future generations. Now, think about this, because I'm not a scriptorian, but I don't really, before the time of Ezra, I'm not sure if I really recall hearing of any scribes in the Old Testament before him. You definitely hear about them all the time in the New Testament, and it's usually um, not in a, in a good context. So I think what he's saying here is that that system at the time of Christ was uh, essentially started here with Ezra. Of course, Ezra would, would not have uh, intentionally made it the way that it turned out to be by the time that Christ was on the scene. But, um, okay, so let's, let's read. Okay, quote, As early as four score years after the return from Babylon, the Babylonian exile, and we know not with accuracy how much earlier, there had come to be recognized as men having authority. Okay, now see, now that's that's where the problem comes in. Uh, in any organization, it doesn't matter if it's Boy Scouts, it doesn't matter if it's a chess club, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's a business or whatever. Wherever there's a group of people, there are other people uh, within that group that aspire to power and control and authority. So even though I'm sure that the way that Ezra organized it was good, you always have those tares that make their way to wherever the power is. So anyway, there had come to be recognized as men having authority, certain scholars, so people that thought that they were so smart, Certain scholars, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that if you're a scholar that you're bad or anything like that. But that's another thing that scholarship, that's another kind of um, magnet for people that want authority. Because by definition, if you're a scholar of a certain subject, uh, then you're kind of an authority, right? You get attention, you get praise, um, and that's what some people want, right? So. Here, it's like two and two birds, one stone. Uh, actual authority, because this has to do with the law. And then uh, scholarly authority. So it's kind of like two and one. Okay, so certain scholars afterward, known as scribes, and honored as rabbis or teachers. In the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, these specialists in the law mm -hmm. constituted a titled class uh, to whom deference and honor were paid. Okay, and that's that's the magnet for the, the crappy people that want power, recognition. Uh, the narcissist. That's what it is. It's the narcissist. Ezra is designated the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. The scribes of those days did valuable service under Ezra and later under Nehemiah in compiling the sacred writings then extent and in Jewish Jewish usage uh, and in Jewish usage, usage those appointed as guardians and expounders of the law 
came to be known as members of the Great Synagogue, or Great Assembly, concerning which we have little information through canonical channels. According to Talmudic record, the organization consisted of 120 eminent scholars. The scope of their labors, according to the admonition traditionally perpetuated by themselves, is thus expressed. Quote, be careful in judgment, set up many scholars, and make a hedge about the law. Now, see, this right here, this is another thing that led to um, problems at the time of Christ. It, it led to basically the law being dead to people, this hedging, the hedging about the law. And you'll see what I mean. They followed their behest by much study and careful consideration of all traditional details in administration by multiplying scribes and rabbis unto themselves, and as some of them interpreted the requirement of setting up many scholars, by writing many books and tractates, moreover, they made a fence or hedge about the law by adding numerous rules which prescribed with great exactness the officially established uh, proprieties for every occasion. So in other words, all the like ridiculous rules that you hear about uh, at the time of Christ, like how many steps can you take on a Sunday and um, all these different things, it sounds like this is where it originally came from. The time of Ezra, not because of Ezra, but because of this organization that attracted uh, power hungry people uh, who probably wanted to look amazing at how how amazingly how good they understood the law and wanted to exert control <laughs> over people that that's my take on it okay so now let's look into second Cedrus a little bit this is on wikipedia now Within the scholarship, I guess there's like different, there's different ways that they um, categorize first and second Ecedris. Okay, essentially, and I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't think it really matters. But uh, there's like in the scholarship, sometimes there's one, two, three, and four Ecedris. So. What we're looking at as second Ecedris is also called fourth Ecedris. <laughs> fourth Ecedris. So don't 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 worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Okay. So fourth Ecedris, which actually is second Ecedris, uh, consists of seven visions of Ezra the scribe. The first vision takes place as Ezra is still in Babylon. He asks God how Israel can be kept in misery if God is just. The archangel Uriel is sent to answer the question, responding that God's ways cannot be understood by the human mind. Soon, how, however, the end would come, and God's justice, justice would be made manifest. Similarly, in the second vision, Ezra asks why Israel was delivered up to the Babylonians, and is again told that man cannot understand this and that and that the end is near. In the third vision, Ezra asks why Israel does not possess the world. Uriel responds that the current state is a period of transition. Here follows a description of the fate of evildoers and the righteous. Ezra asks whether the righteous may intercede for the unrighteous on Judgment Day, but is told that Judgment Day is final. So, you know, I can't argue with that. It, it definitely was a transition period. We're still in, in that transition period where uh, the day is soon coming, the second coming, where Israel will possess the world under the, the kingship of Christ. So, and had everything gone right, uh, basically Christ would have uh his kingdom would have been would have remained if he had not been rejected I, I assume all the way until today but of course you know the lord knew that that wasn't going to happen but hypothetically 
I guess that's what would have happened if he had not been rejected and crucified. And if there wouldn't have been a rebellion against the against his church where the authority was lost. Uh, so anyway, uh, the next three visions are more symbolic in nature. The fourth is of a woman mourning of her only son for her only son. She is transformed into a city where she hears of the desolation of Zion. Uriel says that the woman is a symbol of Zion. The fifth vision concerns an eagle. Okay, so th this is what this is where Ezra's eagle comes in. It's the fifth of seven visions, according to Second Estras. So the fifth vision concerns an eagle with three heads and twenty wings. Okay, wings which I, I have to read through it myself and check different sources. Uh, I'm going to find, well, I've already found three versions of Second Estrus. Uh, one is on BibleStudyTools.com. This one is on BibleGateway.com. This one is eBible.org. And from what I can see so far, they all look like they're the same. I don't see very much variation. But the reason why I'm talking about that is because um, from what I've from what I've seen from the presentations that I've seen, uh, it's it's feathers, not wings. So I'm not I'm kind of confused about that. But anyway, an eagle with three heads and 20 wings, 20 large wings and eight smaller wings uh, over against them. So unless like there's like some kind of like symbolism or like back then they didn't have a word for feathers or if you could just like switch it out like a feather is a wing. I don't know. I don't know if there's something weird like that going on. But OK, the eagle is rebuked by a lion and then burned. Uh, the explanation of this vision, <clears throat> excuse me, is that in this and the explanation appears to be in the book itself. So. The explanation of this vision is that the eagle refers to the fourth kingdom of the division or of the vision of Daniel. Okay, so what's the fourth? What's the fourth uh, kingdom? The fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire, and I suppose you could also include the feet and toes of clay, of iron and clay. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't really know. If this is considered as one, two, three, four parts, or five parts, when when we look at when we, when you compare the Book of Daniel and the Book of Revelation, they're basically companion books. In the Book of Daniel, it uh, so in addition to King Nebuchadnezzar's dream of this statue, there's another way that it's visualized. And it's visualized as beasts. Okay. And so let me um, pull that up. Okay. So uh, when, when Daniel has this vision, it says the first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings, represented by the Babylonian, Babylonian kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. This is in the... Um, Old Testament student manual uh, for Institute. So the first is represented as a lion with eagle's wings. The second uh, is represented as, sorry, uh, the bear. Okay, I should have highlighted that. The second beast is a bear and it represents the Midian and Persian empires. The third kingdom was the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, <clears throat> also known as the Macedonian Empire. And um, let's see, wings, let's see. Wings signify power to move and extend influence. Heads signify governing power or the seat of government. The Grecian kingdom was extended greatly under Alexander and had power over much of the earth. 
Now this one though, okay, that's not what I was. Let's see, Daniel, sorry. Okay, so let's just read it here. So this is in the actual uh, chapter seven of Daniel. The first was like a lion with, and had eagle's wings. The second, like a bear. And then the third was like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a fowl. Okay. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. Okay, so a leopard with four heads and four wings. And then the last one, the last beast, is not um, associated with any animal. This is how it's described. After this, I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had uh, great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Now we've studied this and this represents the offshoots from the, from the Roman Empire after the Roman Empire, Empire falls. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. And according to the student manual, uh, this is likened to the great and abominable church. Some people want to think that this is a one person antichrist that has not appeared yet in world history. I don't take that view. I do think that it's right that this is the great and abominable church. But anyway, go see my channel called, or my playlist called Antichrist. And I go into depth on that. Uh, okay, so little horn before whom there there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, so when we come back here to Wikipedia, and we're talking about, okay, let's go back to where we were. So, okay, the eagle is rebuked by a lion. And I do believe that the lion represents Christ in this um, vision. And so the eagle, now even though in Daniel's vision, the fourth beast uh, was not likened to anything, like to any particular animal, it says the eagle is rebuked by a lion and then burned. The explanation of this vision is that the eagle refers to the fourth kingdom, so the Roman Empire, and potentially its offshoots afterwards <clears throat> of the vision of Daniel with the wings and heads as rulers. The final scene is the triumph of the Messiah over the empire. Yeah, and that, that's going to happen uh, now in the last days when Christ becomes the actual king of the earth. The sixth vision is of a man represented representing the Messiah who breathes fire on a crowd that is attacking him, <laughs> Sym symbolically speaking. Uh, this man then turns to another peaceful multitude, which accepts him. Finally, there is a vision of the restoration of scripture. God appears to Ezra in a bush and commands him to restore the law. Right? And, and we just read about Ezra, that he was essentially, uh, he, he was essentially restoring what had been lost. Uh, at the destruction of, of Israel in Jerusalem. Ezra ga gathers five scribes and begins to dictate. After 40 days, he has produced 94 books, the 24 books of the Tanakh and 70 secret works. Now, we're not going to go off on that because that starts to go beyond the scope of what we're trying to learn here. But... Just so you know, the Tanakh, that is a good thing to know. Uh, I pulled it up. Let's see. Which tab is it? Okay, the Tanakh. The Tanakh, that's that's a name for uh, the Old Testament, right? That That's what the Jews call the Old Testament, the, the Tanakh. Uh, in Christianity, here's the, the Wikipedia article about it, uh, the Hebrew Bible or... Tanakh, 
And over here you can see in Judaism, it's called Tanakh, in Christianity, the Old Testament. And on Kabad.org, it shows you how the Tanakh is, is divided in Judaism. So you have the Torah, which are the first five books of Moses. And then you have the Nevi'im, or the prophets. So you have Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the way down to Zechariah and Malachi. And then you have Ketuvim, or scriptures. So um, here's Ezra, Daniel, Esther, Chronicles, Psalms, Proverbs, right? So in, in Hebrew, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. In English, the Pentateuch, Prophets, and Scriptures. Okay, and I think actually I saw something where these are further subdivided, but again, we're not going to dive into that too deep. So, okay, um, that is actually that's going to be it for this one. Okay. Oh, and here, just so you know, this is a depiction of the beast in Revelation, which is actually a mixture. It's a mixture of all the beasts from Daniel's vision. See, you have the lion, the bear, you have the leopard, the four leopards heads uh, in a leopard's body. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any wings. And then you have uh, the fourth beast that hasn't really been described as a animal with all the the ten horns and the little horn. So uh, it's interesting because we know that Daniel's vision had to do with his future, which at the time it had to do with he was actually in Babylon, right? So he was in the lion or he was in the gold head at that point. And then his future <clears throat> predictions in prophecy was going to be, okay, then there's going to be the Persians and Midians, and then there's going to be the Greeks, and then there's going to be the Romans. And then after that, uh, the aftermath of the Roman Empire. Well, now the book of Revelation, which has to do with our day, with the, the last days, uh, all these things have descended through time, all these different kingdoms, they've kind of combined together different aspects, and that's what we have today is basically a beast system. And um, if you were to spiritually, symbolically represent it, then I guess this is somewhat what it would look like. Okay. So uh, according to Ezra's eagle, the fourth beast, I guess, would have had the image of a of an eagle, I suppose. Um, that's kind of a departure from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation which uh, it doesn't have that imagery. The only eagle within among those beasts would be the lion who had the wings of an eagle, right? Lion with the wings of an eagle. So that's another thing. So, <clears throat> so I guess I would sum it up like this. Um, I'm still interested to find out more about it, but scholarship believes that Second Ecedrus was probably composed in the first century AD. And then secondly, um, the fourth beast, which is not assigned any animal in second Estrus, it, it seems to be given an animal. Uh, unless, unless second Estrus is actually talking about, uh, li like has been proposed, that he's talking about a single kingdom, probably among the feet and the toes, like the United States. Um, and we know that the United States, we do have our national symbol is um, is the eagle, right? Uh, the seal of the United States. Everyone knows that, right? Uh, there are other countries that have eagles as well, but here you have it. So, so we'll have to look at it. Oh, and then the other thing is the idea of uh, wings and feathers. I'll have to research that more, but in in here it talks about uh, wings. The, fir the first verse, it says, On the second night I had a dream. I saw an eagle with 12 feathered wings. Oh, well, here it says feathered wings. 
So there is the concept of feathers versus wings. The 12 feathered wings in three heads rising up from the sea. And uh, whenever you have a beast rising up from the sea, we know that that essentially means that it's, you know, from a far off land, it's from, uh, it, it, it's the idea of like an empire, right? When we look at this, in Revelation, you have the beast that's rising up out of the sea. So it seems to be related to this idea. It seems to be related to this idea. Okay, so that, that'll be it for this first installment, looking into Ezra's Eagle. So uh, we'll do more. I don't know how many more. I want to actually probably read uh, the actual... Uh, verses that have to do with it and kind of talk through it and then just see what other additional resources there are and see what we come up with with this all right so if you haven't already uh, please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it if you'd like to have your photo in one of the next videos uh, your mission photo send it to my email address it's in the description of the video if you like this video, make sure to like it. Uh, make sure to leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share this, and I'll talk to you guys later.